Hello everyone, this is China Paradigm, where we, Dashi Consulting, interview seasoned entrepreneurs in China. Hello everyone, I'm Ashley Davis, the founder of Dashi Consulting and this podcast, China Paradigm. And today, I am someone who is very famous among people who have followed uh, China topics. We have followed on LinkedIn or YouTube. It's Ashley Galina Dutarenok, I pronounced correctly, hopefully. Uh, I have That's a- fabulous. That's weird. That's name. Fabulous, fabulous, Matt. Phenomenal to be on your podcast. Thank you very much. So you you are the founder of Adaris since 2011, and uh, Chosen. I, I I knew you more for Chosen, which is uh, um, um, much more about training, uh, master classes, keynotes on marketing in China, and actually Adaris is much more about. Executing, as I understand. So you begin with Absolutely. execution, and after you 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 are, you have worked on the training. You're also very active online, so you have your own uh, presence online on YouTube uh, with Ashley Talks, and you are also present on Amazon. That's something I, I think our audience will be very <laughs> interested to understand. It's how do you become a bestseller on Amazon? Uh, what have you done? What's 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 the secrets of being so present online uh, and and be able to sustain the energy? Uh, I, I hope we can go in depth into it. So thank you very much, Ashley, uh, for being with us. Could you tell us more about your business? So um, if you can share some metrics about. It could be campaigns you have managed, could be a number of clients you have managed, could be um, about the history of the of the company. It would give a sense to the audience about where where you are in terms of of your development and what you are doing. Absolutely, absolutely, Matt. Thank you so much again for such a such an in depth introduction. So indeed, back in 2011, I started my first company, and uh, I'm based in Hong Kong. So back in 2011, I already moved from mainland China. I used to live in mainland China before, in the city called Chongqing. So in 2010, I relocated to Hong Kong. I had a full time job by then, which was PR manager um, in a local um, firm. So in 2011, I actually started a company and it was because everybody was registering a company in Hong Kong. I do not know. Like literally, it's so easy. You know, it takes a couple of days. And a friend of mine was saying, you know what, now is a good time to register because apparently, you know, they it, it was a very simple procedure and they said they're going to complicate it going forward. So basically, he told me, if you want a company at any point in time, now is a good time to register it. And I was like, okay, well, let, let's do this. So um, I started a company in 2011, um, and it was more of a sidekick, you know, something on the side. I had a full-time job, uh, but this was like a consulting branch. Um, and uh, yeah, slowly and gradually, within two years, it grew. So within two years, in 2013, actually in April, so we are almost at our birthday. In April 2013, I quit my full-time job. And I started doing it full time. So I, it was it was really why did I do that? Uh, it was more of a you know personal journey, I guess, because you get really bored working for somebody else if it's not a dynamic kind of working environment. If you if you don't feel that you're contributing to a hundred percent, and from there onwards, the company was pretty much related to China. So we. Uh, we were not defined as a, you know, as a marketing agency. It was more of a consulting, you know, China marketing uh, plus uh, plus any kind of business support. Really, at that point, so we were still figuring out. I really did not want to go to marketing after years in PR. I felt that okay, the margins are super thin and slim, and I don't really want to go to marketing. Maybe consulting is a sexier thing. And uh, slowly and gradually, really. Um, like in any small business and startup business, you react to what the clients actually want and you start realizing why the clients are coming to you. So very quickly from this kind of general China thing, it turned uh, into um, marketing in China. So we did everything, marketing to China, you know, as of events and blah, blah, blah. And then it moved into social media marketing. Um, and uh, that's where we found our niche. And in terms of the agency right now, so we do focus on executing. So basically, there are three major things. Number one is the strategy for China, uh, especially for big brands that are already in that market and they want to revamp what they are doing in the market. Or they're, again, big brands and they lost a bit of the opportunity to enter China a couple of years back. And right now, they're just setting up. Uh, Secondly, is actually executing it. 
um, managing their campaigns, creating their content, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, then about uh, 2016, I thought that, okay, agency is a great business, but at the same time, I would like to have a product. I would like to have a product that I could actually scale. And my original idea, and I think this is a dream of many entrepreneurs, you would like to create a product and you would basically like to leverage it yeah, and sell uh, to, a lot of, um, to a lot of customers. Um, so we created a platform which was called uh, Chaozan. In Chinese, Chaozan means awesome. So in English, that's Chaozan. And it was a subscription platform where you subscribe to basically very in-depth navigators, very in-depth guides about marketing in China. And uh, for a year, it was, you know, it was running, it was a, um, an interesting, definitely, endeavor. But we realized that in order to promote it to people that are interested in this very specific service, you need to spend a lot of money and gift it to Google and uh, Facebook. And it would basically take uh, three to four hundred US dollars to get uh, leads in. And uh, then the product costs one thousand three hundred US dollars, which which just doesn't make a lot of business sense. Um, yeah, and from there onwards, uh, people actually, we realized that people didn't want to navigate. And people didn't want somebody to tell them what to do in China. People wanted to come and literally walk them by the hand and be there with them and, you know, take take their team essentially on a journey. So that's how a new phase of Chaozan was born with uh, trainings. So right now we do trainings for in-house teams. We train agencies that are working in, uh, in Chinese social media space. Uh, we train uh, top management. We train marketers. And uh, as a spin-off of that, um, I started also doing a lot of keynotes, um, which is you go to conferences and you basically perform in front of a lot of people. Um, and that happened together with you know writing books and becoming a, a thought leader uh, on LinkedIn about China and marketing. So... Bottom line, you asked about, um, you know, becoming an Amazon bestseller. It's actually a journey. And why I spoke for now five minutes talking about how I got here is essentially to uh, explain that it is a journey. Um, it's all around thought leadership. So if you plan to stay in business long term, you need to start doing thought leadership. And a phenomenal way to do that in B2B business is also to write a book about your subject. You just need to make sure that you have the right team in place. For me, for instance, I hired a coach, a phenomenal person who published eight books by himself. And he actually coached me on how do you put together an Amazon bestselling book? How do you launch it? How do you launch ads? How do you place it? And uh, his name is Akash Kariya, guys. If you're connected with me on LinkedIn, he's also on my LinkedIn. He's an amazing, amazing person. So you hire a, you know, a coach. And then, of course, you, you, know, you need to know your topic. So for me, the first book came from, you know, from the first, um, I don't know, 100 presentations that I did. I had all this data. I had all those presentations. Um, you summarize it. And then I, of course, hired a professional copywriter, a professional editor. So uh, a person on my team, she actually for 20 years worked in book publishing and she is able not only to help our nominal English content, but she's able to actually be the editor and be the publisher of the books because she knows how to take my blurb and turn it into something readable and hopefully enjoyable. I see. How, how did you find someone to help you, to coach you on, 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 on creating um, Amazon bestseller? Well, it's the right place, the right time. But basically, um, as I mentioned, my friend Akash, he had a consulting. At that point, right now, he does a lot of public speaking and he still has his Publishing Accelerator course, which is an online course. But oh, by back then, a couple of years back, he was still willing to do a one on one kind of coaching. So that's how we met. Uh, I believe it was through introductions, through personal friend of ours. And, you know, just five or six sessions with Akash were like a revelation. I brought him in. He spoke with my um, editor. He spoke with the team. You know, um, it was an incredible, incredible push and boost um, to, you know, to our book. The thing is, I brought the um, professional when the book was 90% complete. And that is probably one of the mistakes. Okay. <laughs> Bring in the you bring the professional before you start writing a book to make sure that it's the most effective and efficient and you're reaching your results. But um, yeah, anybody who is interested in publishing a book, I would definitely recommend going with professional. And, you know, instead of trying to figure it out all by yourself, because it would have taken me years, 
You pay somebody yeah. and he just takes you on this journey much faster. How much did it cost if someone wants to do the same thing as you did? To, to so hire a coach? Think- Right. I think for Akash in particular, I do not know, there might be some other coaches, but um, I really trust uh, this person. He's absolutely phenomenal. He's got an online course that I believe costs around 1000 or 1500 US dollars to join. So it's a six week mm-hmm. course, but it's online. So you basically join as a group. There's about 20, 30 people joining as a group and you over this six or eight weeks, I don't remember, you actually walk through this journey together. So by the end, like 70% of people, if you you do everything he tells you to do 70% of the people have their book ready but um but uh, what i did with akash again just because i like to move at my own pace i actually did uh, you know personal coaching so that costs depending on the coach uh, probably uh, from 500 us dollars to 1500 us dollars per session so it mm-hmm. it it really depends uh, what's more convenient but essentially anybody in business If you are, if you plan to be long term in business, you need to start thought leadership. Yes, on social media. Yes, you need videos, but essentially you also need to have a book. And there's no excuse in 2019 not to have a book. Very interesting. Um, every time I go to Hong Kong, I'm surprised how people in Hong Kong know little about social media in China, know little about e-commerce in China, know little about, let's say, of mainland China. So. What I, uh, actually I'm, I'm, um, I found out that you have lived in 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 Chongqing in in, in China in mainland China in in the center of China Chongqing for some time you studied there. Uh, did you study in Chinese? Could you tell us more about what you did uh, in in during your studies? How you 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 came up to study in China? And I don't know where you're from, by the way. Could you, could you give us a bit of more background? Absolutely. So uh, if you see me, we are recording some videos and we're recording audio separately. But if you see me right now, I'm smiling at you and I have this long blonde braid hanging on the side. So I, I don't look Asian really, but actually I was born in Asia, in the Russian Far East. I was born in a city called Vladivostok, which borders on Japan, North Korea and China. And uh, since uh, since my early childhood, I was basically traveling to Asia like Europeans would go to France or Italy. I would be going to Asia to places like Korea, Japan and mainland China. So essentially, uh, that's how the story started. And when I was 17 years old, indeed, uh, I relocated to mainland China. And a lot of people ask me, why would I make such a choice? Um, and I, I always tell them that I believe there's only two reasons to move across the globe. One is money. The second one is love. So for me at 17, that was love. A boyfriend of mine at the time, he was studying Chinese at, uh, at the university and we decided to go there together. So I felt it was a phenomenal opportunity to, you know, to, to move to China, to study. Um, I studied business and economics. And uh, yeah, we relocated. And the only Chinese person that we both knew was from Chongqing. So she was, um, she was his professor then. And she was another fantastic, fantastic person, a close friend up until right now, 13 years later. So we decided, okay, why not Chongqing? Because I didn't speak Chinese. First year, I couldn't really study in the university. I had to learn the language. So I relocated to China. Okay, a couple of months before moving to China, I took a private course with a, with, you know, with a teacher. But pretty much my level was like ni hao. And then, and then a couple of, okay, I want to go to bathroom, kind of a, a couple of phrases here and there. And um, yes, moving to Chongqing, um, I thought that it's going to be just one year. And then I'm going to move to places like Beijing or Shanghai. But it was fascinating. It was uh, it was an exciting city. I passed my HSK, which is for people that don't know, it's like 12 full or IELTS. It's your language proficiency test in Chinese. Um, in half a year, I passed HSK six. And uh, the next thing I know, I'm studying economics and business in Chinese university together with Chinese students in Chinese language. So it was really funny how you know how you take notes and everybody's really fast and. And you you were really struggling in the first year, but then you get better and better. So I actually started linear algebra in Mandarin Chinese. Oh. Um, yeah, that was that was my time in Chongqing. And um, as you said, it's a, it's a fascinating city in the heart of China. There are 32, 34 million people in that city. And when I arrived, I was foreigner number 50, literally five zero, because they used to give you those um, residence permits. 
when you land in China on long-term program like bachelor's degree or, or, or some people come for work. So they give you a resident permit, not just a visa. And my resident permit was number 50. And that was, uh, that was quite incredible, quite fun. Um, and slowly and gradually, I believe Chongqing right now is extremely multicultural. There are thousands and thousands of international students. And, you know, every time I read The Economist, every time I read New York Times, there's at least one or two mentions about this phenomenal city because it is growing and developing very fast. Yeah, Chongqing is one of the biggest cities in China. And uh, it's, um, it's high in the mountain, as I, 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 as I know. I've never been there. Uh, and it's uh, set to be the center of West China in the future with I think two or three airports um, uh, very, very well um, deserved by, by transportation and, and uh, airlines. So, yeah, you have been so first studying uh, Chinese and studying business in Chinese in China, and then you moved to Hong Kong. Um, what made you move to Hong Kong? Yeah, a lot of people ask that question. For me personally, it was a lifestyle choice. And don't get me wrong, I love China. I learned so much in China and I go to China right now every week, every two weeks, and my whole business and career is linked to that beautiful uh, mainland uh, part of the country. Uh, but for Hong Kong, I mean, you cannot, you cannot fight it. It's more comfortable in many ways for foreigners to reside here. It's a, it's a different community. It's different. Like, for example, in Hong Kong, we've got 200 kilometers of hiking trails. We have beautiful beaches. We've got just a different, slightly different lifestyle. Back in, uh, back in China, in Chongqing in particular, you know, back in the day, we didn't have uh, Western food. My refuge from Chinese food was McDonald's. And Hong Kong was just a striking difference because we had all the phenomenal, you know, Italian, French, uh, German, you name it, cuisines. So for me, it was purely a lifestyle choice that I made in 2010. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy with that choice. Um, and um, it's very close to China, but you have options to live like in China, like in Europe, like in US. And I personally enjoy that flexibility. Got it. Um, talking about yourself, um, you have been um, publishing a lot, and uh, I'm uh, I'm doing it with a podcast as well. And I feel one of the difficulties to actually uh, create your own content, pushing your own personality, your own person online. How do you feel about it? It's all about it's all about being an influencer, being a care well. Um, um, uh, everyone has to do it now. Uh, everyone is a, who is a business leader, everyone who has a company, but it needs confidence. It needs to have something to say. It needs to have content. It needs to, to uh, it requires also to understand technology and everything. How did you f begin and how did you feel about it? And Matt, you are absolutely right. Everybody needs to do it. So it's not optional anymore. If you don't do it, somebody else will. And you're going to lose your a uh, little bit your spot, your edge. Uh, but at the same time, nobody is born with that ability to be a phenomenal, let's say, thought leader. It is learned. And the confidence does, doesn't come naturally. For me, for instance, when I just started um, putting videos online, which was about two years ago, I absolutely hated myself on videos the way I sounded the way I looked you, you know that you've got this inner voice right you, you can hear yourself very differently compared to how other people hear you so when I got to hear myself I was like no 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 no, no. that's not how I speak that's not me and it's uncomfortable um what I do always if something I know needs to be done but it's uncomfortable I just make a public commitment and I give it four to five months so that's what happened two years back. I made a public commitment on my social media. I said, guys, you're going to see a lot of videos of Ashley. I'm sorry. Those that don't like it, please just don't basically just, just ignore, just block my content. You know? But I'm going to be publishing those videos. And um, I made a public commitment and I said, I'm going to do it for four months. And uh, for four months, nobody was watching my videos. And it was, to be honest, very frustrating because every Saturday I would spend four or five hours recording those five videos for the coming week and nobody was watching it. And um, it's very hard on the ego, you know, as well, and, and also your confidence. But um, after four months, there was one video about WeChat. And suddenly, I mean, I, I won't say that it went viral. I, I, I can't say that. But suddenly, there were like one or 2,000 views. And I was so encouraged. And there were like 20 or 30 comments. 
And I said, oh my God, that's what people want. So it's really not about, um, like you mentioned earlier, it's not about pushing yourself, uh, you know, to publish. What you need to do is you need to make a public commitment and you need to commit uh, to yourself that, yes, I'm going to do that. You need to understand that there is um, an edge. There's something you can share. You've got the gift that you need to share out because essentially I believe that information comes onto you, you digest it, and then you need to pass it on. If you, if you, if you don't pass it on, you are basically killing that, that universal flow of energy and information. So you need to pass it on. Um, and this is just the discipline. And at the same time, you will never know what to share. Like you said, what kind of content can you create? Like for me, I had no idea that this video about WeChat would be such a hit. I didn't know before for four months. I was recording useless videos nobody cared about. Um, The same with my LinkedIn content. About a year and a half ago, I started publishing content on LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, uh, okay, there were people interested here and there, 10 likes, 20 likes, and somebody reacted. But then I published um, a report about, uh, I don't know, um, I don't remember what it was, maybe WeChat or mini programs, or it was about e-commerce in China. And suddenly, I'm telling you, I was in the US then attending a seminar, business seminar. I wake up in the morning and I see that there are 400 likes and uh, there are like 50,000 views. I was completely shocked. I thought there was a glitch in the system. So I call my office and I say, oh, Natasha, can you check my LinkedIn? And then she checks. She says, yeah, yeah, there's all these people. They want this report. So that's how I discovered people really want somebody not to curate that content for them because I don't have time to right now sit and create 20 reports a month. But people are looking for others they trust, not just for random others, but somebody they trust to actually curate that content so i go out i look for all these new reports and the ones that i find are interesting i digest them i share them out the main takeaways and if people are interested in that they will ask me for you know for this report i did not create the report i always say the report is created by kpmg the report is created by i do not know that's your consulting but uh, people trust that whatever ashley shares is valuable and that is why right now for instance you know a year later so many report producers, people that actually go and research and put it together, they send it over to me and I have mm, very often multiple times of their engagement and reach just because I build it up over time. I see. Um, I saw. I, I looked at your LinkedIn profile. I looked at what you were posting. There was a tactic that I saw uh, uh, used by, by some agencies, which is to publish the pictures of the report, and then to say, if you want the report, uh, write down the email and the comments, uh, or send us a message. Is it, is it the way you, 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 you did it? Yeah, so for me, uh, that, was, that was my first post a year and a half ago that went basically to my, to my um, understanding rather successful. So people wanted to get a copy of it. And right now, also, if people want to report, I say, basically, if you're my first degree connection, just put a plus below. You don't need to send anything. If you're a second degree connection, uh, give an email or uh, send basically a DM in the in the invitations. Why is it done? Because when people comment under the post, uh, it becomes even more successful. So basically, more people see it. Yeah? Um, that's yeah. why you're doing it. If you're just publishing a report out there, maybe you're going to have 20, 30, 50, 40, 50,000 views. But if there is engagement, basically it boosts it out and it becomes even more successful. Um, I think the most successful report I had reached around 460,000 views. Wow. And it's LinkedIn. Yeah, it's not Instagram that we're talking about. It's a different quality of people that is on LinkedIn. And um, I believe that, you know, it's a, it's a fair game if you are giving value right and you want your content to go uh, to go viral i believe that this is um, you know this is acceptable and at the same time people really enjoy videos from china because a lot of um, a lot of guys are actually located outside of china and work with that market so um, they, they see the new technology, they see the lifestyle, they see some really interesting snapshots from platforms like Douyin. Um, and you know that in the West, even through TikTok, you do not have access to that content. 
right? So basically, um, once in a while, I'll I'll check a couple of new things, some hot topics, some cool videos. You put it up there. You still need to talk about something related to what people care about. And usually those videos are also extremely successful. Do that yourself? Um, the download or publishing. So all the posts I write myself in terms of looking for videos, uh, I don't look for videos anymore and I don't look for reports. So what happens, my team right now looks for reports and stuff, they send it over to me and then I say, okay, this and this and this. And I write the post myself, right? Um, and also in my messages, LinkedIn messages, I used to answer them myself. But right now with the inflow of um, inbox messages, uh, I probably only answer, uh, basically, I've got a personal assistant who uh, goes through all the messages and she gives me the digest, the most important ones where she cannot answer or direct people. So I also look after just a part of my mailbox. But all of the posts on my LinkedIn, yes, are written originally by Ashley. That's why you sometimes see spelling mistakes because it's done on the go on the mobile phone. <laughs> So which platform is the most powerful for you? Is it LinkedIn? Is it YouTube? I see you are very active on YouTube as well. Uh, are you using other platforms? Uh, are we talking about the West now? We will go after, uh, we will move on uh, um, topics about China more specifically. But which platform do you see with more traction? Uh, LinkedIn, absolutely. It's just hands down LinkedIn. Um, when I just started, I actually tested all platforms, including Medium, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And LinkedIn, in my um, world, is definitely the platform that provides you opportunities for direct and free reach, and that's what nobody else does. You need to pay for any um, any traffic. You need to pay for any reach. It uh, doesn't matter what, what is the quality of your content. On Facebook, you cannot go popular. You cannot be trending if you don't pay money. Uh, same with Instagram. And also, it's the quality of people. Well, in my world, I'm not trying to reach, um, you know, uh, the general demographics. I'm trying to reach very specific audience that are interested in, let's say, marketing, business, China, etc. And LinkedIn is the right platform to do that. Um, in terms of YouTube, I republish all my videos on YouTube. Previously, I used to create videos for YouTube. And right now, I publish a lot of videos on LinkedIn. And in order to keep them in one place, all the videos in one place, I okay. also republish them on YouTube. And to be honest, I've had my YouTube channel. I mean, I opened it with my um, Gmail account many, many years ago. But I started openly and uh, taking care of my YouTube channel probably about a year, year and a half ago. Um, and right now I have four plus thousand followers. So you just think about it. It's, it's nothing. It's, it's so, so, so little. Why? First of all, on YouTube, people are not looking for this kind of content. People are looking for more entertainment, engagement. Like if it, even if it's a business blog, it's more like following somebody's life or somebody cool went to meet Jay-Z and then this is sexy and people want to watch it. But uh, people are not looking for this kind of content that much. And uh, even, even if they found that content, they don't subscribe. How many YouTube channels are you subscribed yeah. to? Right. So it's just a different, different platform on LinkedIn. It's more of a building professional network. So if they think that, OK, you are actually providing value and you need to always put that first. You need to figure out through testing. What do your people want? Do they want videos? Do they want do they want uh, reports? Do they want long articles? What do they want? And then give it to them when you provide them, not what you want to give, but what they want to get. That's when they feel that. Wow. This is amazing. I would like to follow this person. And on, on LinkedIn, it's not about following. It's really about building a connection. That's why you need to speak with people. You need to engage with them. You need to create LinkedIn local events when you go and meet each other in person. Um, every time I'm flying to Shanghai, it's quite amazing because LinkedIn is so powerful. I'm flying to Shanghai or I'm even in Germany, in Bavaria. Um, uh, you know, I publish something and people are like, oh my God. So there are 20 people that want to meet in Bavaria or I'm in the airport and somebody comes up and says, oh, are you Ashley? And I said, like, oh my God, what's going on? Because, because this is the right demographics and it's a small world. I see. The, the question I ask myself uh, by publishing offered on LinkedIn, I'm using LinkedIn as well as a tool to, to, to advertise and to talk about what we do 
including what we are currently doing, so the podcast vlog. And sometimes I'm thinking to myself, I'm I'm doing too much. I'm too active. Uh, as you said uh, previously, you, you you told to your friend, if I publish too publish too much, just don't follow me anymore. What what how do you how do you react to the, the overdose? Maybe it's too much. Maybe it, do you uh, do you limit yourself? Do you edit? Do you have a do do, do you have a, a planning? How how do you how do you work out with uh, too much content? Right. So this is a phenomenal question. Um, I be I believe that there is such thing as too much. Yes. Uh, but at the same time, it depends what you publish. So if if everything you give is value, 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 I think it's fine. But if if it's uh, value, sale, 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 value, people are going to get annoyed. So I know a lot of people that uh, that we are connected with, first degree connections, and what they tell me is every time I open LinkedIn, I see only your posts. Basically, it's like Ashley's post and then, or somebody commented under Ashley's post, and somebody commented under Ashley's post. And what I tell them very honestly, and I, I'm absolutely not um, not joking, if that's the case, just block my content. It's fine. Um, if something becomes annoying or uncomfortable, just, just hide it. Um, I don't believe that you need to you know, edit yourself and plan it very strictly. You need to have a general plan. For example, I think that at least I need to publish once on LinkedIn every day. Sometimes weekends I don't do it. Um, but also sometimes I already have a plan, for example, for reports. I know that I need to publish two reports a week. So that's my plan, right? And sometimes it's something new comes out and I really want to talk about it. And I also had this 100 daily videos. I had a challenge by... Uh, a friend of mine. Um, so basically there was a daily video, there was a report, and then there was something interesting that came out. So then there's three or four posts a day. That becomes a bit too much. So then you need to just uh, use your common sense to determine, yeah? So to answer your question, I do have a plan for major content and I just keep the rest flexible. If you feel that you're publishing too much, you're probably publishing too much. But um, if you are delivering value, um, then, uh, then I think, you know, um, you know, you, you can just, you can just let it be and also just announce publicly and tell your people that if your content is annoying, they can give you feedback that you're very, very open to get the, you know, to receive people's feedback and that if it's really annoying them, that it, it's absolutely fine to, you know, to hide your content that you will not be offended. I think this is, this is absolutely fine as well. So we're halfway of the, um, the podcast for today. Uh, now I, I I like to switch on your your, your business. Um, um, I I'd like um, to understand better about Alaris. Um, um, you are mentioning WeChat, Weibo, Douyin, and Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, which are very two demographics in terms of uh, clients. One is. Uh, Western, one is Chinese, at least for the Chinese market, and one for the Western market. So could you tell us more about uh, who your clients are? Are they Chinese companies going overseas? Are they foreign companies, Western companies uh, uh, entering or actually developing uh, within your Chinese market? Absolutely. So the company started with the focus on China. So international brands going into China. And that's how it was for the past, uh, let's say, seven years. In the past year, or let's say year and a half, we got uh, a very big client. Actually, one of our biggest clients right now is a big Chinese brand. And that's where the Western social media came into play. So still 90% of our business comes with, from international companies going into the China market and we handle their Chinese social media accounts. We create their content, we run the campaigns, we manage their community, we work with the bloggers, etc. And because again, in China, especially when we talk about big brands, uh, it's all about you know trust. It's all about this brand needs to trust you. The founder needs to trust you to handle um, uh, Western social media well. And they want to know that you understand their environment. They, they want to know uh, that you understand what's happening in China. You are able to translate that well for the West. So that's how we got our project. Um, and that's how we started working with Western social media. I see. Uh, 
I would be surprised that agencies could talk on behalf of their clients and managing their social media. It's like someone telling me how to dress every day. So it's talking about yourself. Um, how, how, how do you manage uh, in China the identity, the content of your clients? Do you have a process? Do you have an organization which is making it compliant with clients, meeting every week, meeting every month? How, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you work on this? Absolutely. Um, you are right that social media is your identity in China. You know what we say in mainland China? Uh, if you, Basically, you are what you publish. If you publish something good, you're good. If you publish something bad, you're bad. And if you publish nothing, you are nothing. So it's really, it's really that urgency that people need to, uh, need to have when they approach their social media content. And uh, especially when we talk about international brands, there is a huge mismatch and misunderstanding with what social media is for China. It's not Facebook. It's not Instagram. It's not your, you know, kitty cat picture blog and place to stalk your friends. It is essentially a CRM in China. That's your biggest, most powerful CRM tool. It is, yes, a marketing platform. Social media is also, mm, uh, you know, um, life services platform. Life services, it means you, uh, you access all the digital, your digital lifestyle and offline lifestyles through it. And besides that, it is an e-commerce platform. It's basically like Amazon meets Taobao, right? All this social commerce. So that's what social media is for China. And when we work with uh, international brands, um, we, it depends whether the brand is familiar with China or not. Most of them are. We translate. We basically, first of all, we learn about the brand. Uh, if it is a big one, for example, like Jack Daniels, then there is a very comprehensive system where you go in and for several weeks, you're being trained how to understand the brand, what is appropriate, what is not appropriate. Then you work with the compliance team that tells you, okay, that's what we can publish. That's what we cannot publish. And here's why. So first, it's always training. If it is a smaller brand and they don't have, you know, these systems uh, in place, then you need to create one for them agree on certain, um, I would say, boundaries, right? And then within those boundaries, you need to reinvent the brand for China because you cannot translate it. You cannot, you know, bring it from, from the US or from Europe and just, and just interpret it uh, into Chinese and think it's fine. So that's how it is. We essentially become their marketing team for China. And um, we run this communication on their behalf. And um, it always works well when you're well-prepared, well-trained, and you have established boundaries, established playground where you can run around and do your thing, but know what are the gates that you cannot cross. I see. You said CRM, marketing platform, and e-commerce platforms. In first one, CRM, uh, what, what CRMs do you use and what do you look at when you, when you choose a CRM or when you have to estimate, a, a, evaluate a CRM? Right. So in terms of uh, CRM, I mean, the function of uh, social media platforms in China is CRM. So it doesn't matter what provider you use. For example, on WeChat, you can build your own mini program that essentially becomes your CRM. Or you can just have a, a shop on Xiao Hongshu and that becomes your CRM because you're collecting people's information and their profiling. Um, what I mean by that is that in the West, we are always trying to capture people's email and phone number. So as marketers, that's what you're hunting for pretty much. Why? Why are you hunting for it? It's because when you capture their email, for instance, you can spam them nonstop. So when the person said, yes, I would like to receive your news, that's it. Hallelujah. You're basically running around and sending them content. And um, the cost per contact becomes very, very low. And in China, that doesn't work. First of all, on email, people are not on email. People don't use emails, right? You, you live in China, you know what this is. So people are on WeChat, people are on QQ, people are on other social media platforms. If they work for international companies, yes, they might use we, um, email, but very, very rarely. And secondly, if you start calling them, so if you capture their uh, mobile phone number, they will actually report you because very few people know that in Chinese culture, you know, it's, it's all about not losing the face. So let's say, for example, you're sitting there in the office packed with other 
colleagues and suddenly somebody gives you a call and then you need to be there sitting and whispering into the phone. That's embarrassing. So in China, people do not prefer to receive calls. They prefer to record voice messages, text messages, and basically keep that channel communication um, outside of the public view. So do not call them because they're going to be so annoyed they're going to report to you. So as a brand, what can you capture? How can you make sure that you're building meaningful database? This is possible through SCRM, social CRM. So basically your WeChat, Weibo, Douyin, Xiaohongshu, et cetera, become your, um, your guide into the world of your customer. And you ask what kind of CRMs you're using. Each of these social media platforms has different providers, different options. There is an internal CRM, something that's inbuilt already. If you're selling or if you're marketing on that platform, you will have access to that back end. Or you can build on top. You can use some tools. You can build your own program um, to capture it. And essentially, for many brands, it's important not just to capture that information, but also be able to plug it into their central system. Because they, as a global brand, very often they have a you know a global system. And I think that's where a lot of uh, brands are not doing it successfully because in order to plug it into the main system, they still try to capture a phone number and an email address and put a okay. Chinese, Chinese person's name there. Uh, and, and again, their email and their phone number, two very useless, um, I would say, uh, um, contact details uh, for China. We've seen that there is um, this connection between um, the shop, the, the, the information you collect from the shoppers in the shop and online. And you are mentioning that the first uh, challenge to reconnect who shopped online and who shopped offline. But the challenge you are mentioning as well, I feel, and you are going to tell me if it's strange or not, is that when your client or your follower is engaged on Weibo, then on Xiaohongshu, then on Douyin, how do you connect everything so that you know it's the same person? Uh, have you found that an easy solution or at least uh, something workable? Absolutely not. So basically, it's, a, it's the biggest mystery um, in China right now how to resolve that thing. There are solutions that are trying to uh, trying to basically give your customer some sort of digital token. And then doesn't matter which social media account they're using, this little token is actually following them. So you can somehow think or determine that this is the same person. Uh, some platforms are working together better. Uh, other platforms like, for example, WeChat and Weibo, they can they totally hate each other, right? There's no integration whatsoever. You cannot transfer people's uh, people's contacts um, from one to the other. So it is a challenge. I believe that going forward, as China becomes even more digital society, um, I believe that there will be some solutions, but I don't think it will come from platforms themselves. They don't want to integrate and share the data. Um, I believe it will come from e-commerce and new retail providers such as JD.com plus Tencent or Alibaba that actually need that information in order to serve new retail customers better in all offline spaces and online spaces. Um, you mentioned uh, doing your profile describing uh, Alaris. Uh, it's pretty new, uh, less than that. Less, less than 18 months, maybe two, two years maximum. Um, have you made some campaign on doing? I, I feel a lot of uh, our, our, our own clients and people around us are asking, but does it really work doing? Can you sell through doing? Can you create a community through doing? Um, people consume on doing, people are on doing, they, they watch video, but can you leverage it for a brand? How do you leverage it for a brand? Would you, would you have some cases to share? Right. So Douyin indeed is a rather new platform. It's about two years old. Uh, in terms of consumption on Douyin, um, they recently introduced their purchasing and shopping cart. And I believe it's still a powerful platform, but for, the, for a very specific product group. For example, I remember this phenomenal campaign when uh, there was a toothpaste, a special toothpaste that reduces your gum inflammation. And they had a very popular um, let's say idol, um, young people idol to advertise it. 
And the power of um, that advertising was in the format because the format was you start your doyen and suddenly this guy who is like Leonardo DiCaprio to my generation, right? And the, to Chinese generation right now, he's a super, super cool dude starts brushing his teeth in your face. He is literally standing there and brushing his teeth and he's talking about gum inflammation and how you need to really prevent it by this specific uh, brand of toothpaste. And people clicked and people bought and it was very, very successful. Um, some brands, for example, Haval, it's a SUV brand, um, a Chinese brand of SUV cars. They are extremely successful. Um, I think they got more than 2 billion views for their latest campaigns um, of F5. F5 is one of their models. And they created a very fun uh, campaign where they created this filter, um, which is like a video, like augmented reality video. So if you put yourself in the camera frame, suddenly a little SUV car will drop down next to you and slowly this car will turn into uh, into um, a transformer and he will start dancing together with you and then he will show you let me show you f5 yeah so it will be an f5 and more than a hundred thousand people recorded that video shared that video became you know a part of that movement and i believe that the sales also went up quite significantly after that campaign again because it was um something very very cool and a lot of people in the west when they listen to this they think oh my goodness isn't doyin tiktok and tiktok is a platform for teenagers for 13 year olds for 14 year olds how is it possible how can you sell cars on a platform like that but in china you'd be surprised doyin for instance is the biggest social media platform for car brands including luxury car brands such as bmw uh, mercedes benz etc cetera, etc cetera. and there are sales and it does happen. So, um, you know, if you want to sell uh, something um, cool, unusual, or you have a really thought through visual campaign, you will be able to do that. The same thing with liking coffee, right? Or this fortune tea, you, you definitely heard this story, like this fortune tea in China basically blew up because of Douyin just because of that one platform. And for those people that do not know what a fortune uh, tea is, it's basically a bubble tea brand. And on the lid, they print the answer to your question. So when you're placing an order, like in Starbucks, right? They ask you, what's your name? But here they ask you, what's your question? And your question can be, will I get married this year? Your question will be, you know, what will be my girl cow score? Or, you know, will I get this promotion? Anything you want. And they, they, they give you your tea and you open the lid, you take off the lid and you will see the answer to your question printed there. And because this, mm, uh, this, this uh, format became extremely successful in Douyin, everybody was publishing videos about it. And right now, um, uh, you know, this Fortune Tea is one of the biggest bubble tea chains in China. Um, and as you see, it is successful both online and offline. <laughs> A lot of people are asking how to connect Douyin to e-commerce, but basically, first of all, Douyin is a media platform. The same way as you you would uh, buy on 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 space of a, of a newspaper, or space on, and on a TV, uh, like in the old times. I mean, still existing. Um, and um, it's relating to uh, another interview I made of someone who was um, working on a Michelin uh, guide, and he told us. A restaurant to be successful has to be playful. And I feel that what you are describing yeah. is to be playful, including with the Fortune T, uh, not only with Doin. Let, let's let's go to, to let's move to other platforms. People were saying Weibo is dead. Uh, what, what's your what's your feedback on this? Right. So in terms of going to uh, what you just mentioned, being playful, it's not just the restaurant. Everything right now in China needs to be playful. Why? Because we have entered the stage and age of retail entertainment. So whatever retail that's happening, be it food or you go to hair salon or you go into the shop, be it online or offline, it's all about being entertained. It's about the experience in other words. So you need to be playful, you need to be fun, and you need to be a part of this movement, which we call retail entertainment.
Um, the question was just now get, about Weibo, right? Yeah. Is it is it that yeah. uh, we saw that Weibo actually has good uh, financial numbers, not not that bad, in fact. Uh, they did a lot on live streaming. They did a lot on social e-commerce. Uh, but since that, a lot of companies and brands are switching budgets from Weibo to uh, which are doing and even Xiangshu. What do you feel? It's fair. Right. So, to be honest, Weibo was proclaimed dead many, many times over the past four years. You know, when WeChat came out, everybody was running and pulling their hair and screaming, oh my God. Then uh, Douyin came out and Xiaohongshu became popular. The same thing, they go, okay, uh, you know, Weibo is in decline. Um, actually, the revival of Weibo came a couple of years back when they purchased um, uh, Izubo and Miao Pai, right? Live streaming platforms and short video platforms. So that was the revival because a lot of young people went back onto this platform. Another revival came when Alibaba uh, gave um, a lot of money to this platform to boost it. So more than 30% of that company is actually um, powered by Alibaba's um, investment. Um, I believe that Weibo is there to stay. They keep reinventing their platform. They keep adding um, you know, services, for example, for bloggers, for thought leaders, where you can follow a, you know, a blogger and you can pay a subscription fee. They keep it very vibrant in terms of, in terms of again, uh, the way content spreads in uh, sharp contrast to WeChat. Um, they are moving and shifting from being a news platform because we have news platforms like Total, for example, that you cannot be Total, right? They are shifting from that and being slightly gossipy kind of platform into more, um, you know, thought leadership, pretty pictures, some kind of merger between Instagram, really, um, campaign platform and Facebook in many ways. So another thing that you cannot really beat is that Weibo still has about 70% of total Chinese KOLs and bloggers. So mm. if we talk about thought leadership, it still largely happens on Weibo. Um, if you want to get eyeballs, if you want to get in front of a lot of people, this is the platform for you to go and do your branding. Um, if you want to build one-on-one -on -one connections, then you go to other platforms, right? So I believe that it's there to stay. It's definitely, it definitely needs to innovate its business model. It definitely needs to, you know, stay ahead of the curve. But I believe that they have a strong backing by Alibaba. They are smart people. Uh, they will uh, keep the show running until they figure out what's the next best thing. And then they might purchase another company to plug it into their ecosystem and make themselves even stronger. Talking about the last three words on your description for uh, Alaris, uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Would you, would you be able to talk more about the case uh, of a Chinese company uh, you mentioned going overseas? Certainly, you are going to get more and more of those cases. Uh, could you describe what you do? Uh, what are the challenges? How you switch from basically managing Weibo, uh, Weibo which are doing, and all the uh, uh, Chinese um, social media to use uh, Facebook, Instagram, which are not yours, because I understand that you are very familiar with yours, but here you have to use the ones of uh, Chinese clients. Right. So um, our the brand that we're managing right now, it's uh, uh, the world's largest education prize, uh, which is powered by uh, a Chinese philanthropist. In fact, China's biggest education philanthropist. Um, he is also the co-founder of Tencent. So these are the people that we're working with. And of course, the challenges are number one, China in general, when, when we talk about brands or when we talk about organizations or we talk about philanthropy, China in the rest of the world is very misunderstood. And very often it is also villainized. And this is the biggest challenge. It's not about translating the messages and finding the right words. If you understand the product or you understand the organization or you understand the outcome, the big goal, what uh, this product or this organization is trying to achieve, you can always, you know, find the right words and the right messages and you need to adjust them platform by platform. But the challenge, the biggest challenge is really in that perception. 
Uh, and the perception, unfortunately, is that if it is a product, then okay, it's cheap and it's bad. And if it's a technology product, then they're all spying on us. They just want to come and capture the market because they want to spy on us. And if it is, a, for example, something like a philanthropy, mm, yeah, people people just don't know whether it's genuine or not. They, they don't understand the, what's going on. And very often they don't want to hear. Right. So that's why the challenge here is really becoming a part of a global community. So as a brand, you need to cooperate with um, other brands. You need to you need to establish partnerships, cross promotions. You really need to basically play with the big boys in the West in order to be um, affiliated, accepted and somehow, you know, have a slightly positive, more positive um, first impression. Because when people hear a brand from China, uh, you know, it's it's not always like it's the brand from France or a brand from Italy or a brand from the US. It's a slightly different connotation. I believe that in some countries like Southeast Asia, like Africa, this is changing. Uh, Europe and the US are slightly behind, slightly behind in that respect. I am a strong believer that we're going to see more and more Chinese brands, Chinese organizations, Chinese uh, everything, uh, technology um, spreading and going global and changing the way we live, the way we work, the way we the way we perceive reality. Um, so I believe this is continuous education um, and uh, and also um, and also playing with the you know with other big kind of uh, kind of uh, players in that market that will make a huge difference. The sooner people will understand that China is not all evil and all encompassing kind of uh, kind of mastermind behind all of their biggest fears, um, uh, the sooner people understand that the better it would be for uh, essentially everyone. And it's exciting to play some role in that education, continuous education. Yeah, I feel it's very difficult to to find a balanced view on China, um, especially if, if with everything which is happening in the world now. Um, let, a few words on 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 Chosan. Um, you are delivering training master classes. My question is, what are the main questions that you are answering to those master classes and trainings that your clients have? Right. So most of the questions are. Um, very, I would say, tailored to their organizations. And most of the times these are trainings that, again, an agency or a certain internal team of a big brand invites you in and says, okay, please train us. We really want to know that. Um, uh, people are always interested in bloggers. People are always interested in running campaigns and, you know, how to, how to run an effective campaign because China is very expensive and you don't want to throw money outside of the window. And most of these brands already work with agencies, but they want to understand beyond what agency tells them. They want to be, they want to grow their own internal experts that will be able to have a meaningful intellectual discussion with the agency, not just, oh, okay, let's do that, right? People ask a lot of questions about the new retail, where this is going. Uh, people talk about modern Chinese consumers because they're changing so fast. We talk about the trends. We talk about, you know, the the realities of life of people in different parts of China, because Chinese consumers are not a homogeneous group, but people living in first tier cities or people living in South China uh, or living in central China, extremely, extremely different. Um, so yeah, it's basically a platform focus. For example, uh, if it's a new platform like Douyin or Xiao Hongshu or um, uh, I do not know, Duoshan or something like this, People want to know platform-specific tips and best practices. People want to know always KOLs, advertising campaigns, and they want to understand the portrait of their consumers and how to move them uh, on this journey of new retail that uh, China is right now uh, so good at. How do you stay informed? How do you stay up to date? Uh, how do you select the, the content? There's so much content to, to read how do you do absolutely and this is also why everybody in this space especially if you are internal team if you're not in touch with so many different touch points but only look at your industry you really need to at least once a year update yourself because china is moving so fast 
There's so many new developments, new features on social networks, new trends, new hot topics. You constantly need to stay on top and, you know, and, and uh, uh, pay effort to be there. Uh, for me, I'm very lucky to have an incredible team that is right now, when previously I used to do it myself, uh, right now I have an incredible team that are actually in the trenches. So they actually execute campaigns and they execute strategies for the clients. At the same time, a part of their job is to give me all this digest. So when we come up with a with a training materials for a specific uh, for a specific outcome, we do not take it from the shelf and present it. We always revise it. We always revise it. We always add new stuff. We do the research. So basically, I have the team that goes and searches for all that stuff. The big trends, I know, right? The big things, I know. But you always need to dig deeper. And for me, I again, I just have the people that are able to do that professionally uh, well. And that's how I'm so, so incredibly lucky and blessed and grateful to have them. Otherwise, it would be, um, it would be a huge undertaking to do it all by yourself. It's already one hour. It went very fast. Uh, thank you very much, Ashley. It was very, very interesting. I think there are many other topics we could we could go further and dig in, uh, but uh, it's already one hour. How did you like it? It was phenomenal. Thank you so much, Matt, for having me. And you are a phenomenal host that really makes the conversation flow. <laughs> thank you very much. You are too. It was easy with you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, it will be published, I think, within a week. Uh, and I hope you all enjoyed uh, the show. Thank you very much.